Welcome. I would like to call to order the Gig Harbor City Council meeting of Monday, September 13th, 2021. It's 5.30. Tonight's City Council meeting is being broadcast live through Zoom. Residents can give comment during the public comment portion of the meeting by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window or by pressing star nine on your phone. Please wait to be called on the, uh, at the time. Public comment on items that are not on the agenda will be a separate from each comment portion that is at each council bill. Public comment is not a Q&A, but a time for to make a public statement. A uh, roll call, uh, Council Member Aversol. Here. Council Member Denson. Here. Council Member Franich. Here. Council Member Hines. Here. Council Member Markley. Here. Council Member Rodenberg. Here. Council Member Whoop. Here. Thank you. This is Mayor Kit Kuhn. Interim City Administrator Tony Pasecki. Here. Interim City Clerk Josh Stecker. Here. City Attorney Daniel Kinney. Here. Public Works Director Jeff Langholm. Here. Community Development Director Katrina Knudsen. Here. Finance Director Dave Rodenbach. Here. And Police Chief Kelly Busey. I'm here. Great. I don't think there's anyone I haven't called, but speak up now. Okay. To reach, read, uh, you can give a, if you wanted to give a comment, uh, you can also press the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom meeting. If you are calling into the Zoom meeting by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing the star nine on your phone. And when using your phone to call in, you may need to press star six to unmute yourself and your name in the, or the last three digits of your phone number will be called out when it is your time to speak. And again, all speakers will have three minutes and you could also have submitted your comment before three o'clock to our city clerk in order for that to be read. Right now, please uh, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, States of, America, of America and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, which stands one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and, liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council. Are there any changes to the agenda tonight? Okay, the agenda stands. Are there any clarifying questions on the consent agenda? Uh, yes, Mayor, I have a couple of clarifying questions on consent agenda item number three. Okay. Go for it. So uh, is this, uh, this is something new for us. So can you just, is this something that's been going on through Seattle Public Utilities? Uh, for a while and, and how, how did we decide that to get on board with this? This access to the Washington State Reference Network is something that Public Works has been using for many years. Uh, prior to now, we have not been required to pay for access. Uh, it has been provided to the city at no cost. So uh, this is this agreement that you see before you tonight is new. The Seattle Public Utilities has indicated to the city though that they feel that they could use an extra antenna in this region and uh, have offered if we to, uh, provide them at some point in the future a place to locate an antenna, then they would waive indefinitely the um, fee to use their Washington State Reference Network. So as it says, what th they are the central processing center for the state. Yes, that's my understanding. Okay, and I mean, uh, is there any downside to this? Uh, no, I don't think there's any downside to this. So uh, the, the, even the cost to put up or an antenna and working with them to have an antenna installed in the future if they feel it's necessary, uh, I believe would be uh, quite a cost savings to the city compared to paying uh, $1,900 annually per login. All right. 
Very good. I would move for approval of the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. Councilmember Wook, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion passes 7 0. And I'd like to say a few things under the mayor's report. As we know, Saturday was the anniversary of 9 11. Uh, many mourn the loss of lives in various ways. I would like to give a moment of silence for prayer. A couple other updates. Uh, we have an update on the Native American signage. Uh, council had passed resolution 1199, which authorized the mayor to work with entities that supported uh, the tribe. We're working on the various things as, the, as they become ready. So we're showing you some of them right now. This is our new park sign that says Austin Park at Tualaca Estuary, place where game exists and ancestral homelands of the Squababish Swiftwater people, band of the Puyallup tribe. There's a beautiful sign. And as you can see the brass plaque right below it, it used to say Austin Estuary. Uh, we kept it simple. So instead of spending the money of replacing the whole plaque, we actually ground down the name that said Austin Estuary. And we put a plate over it and bolted it in that said Austin Park. The sign that's to the right of me actually is going to be wrapped. We have a couple of signs there that we're going to work on. That one's going to talk about the Austin family and the lumber industry. We just have to change a couple of words that say Austin Estuary to Austin Park. So we're actually going to wrap the sign uh, so it's less expensive, probably just a couple hundred dollars or less to wrap the sign with the same information. We're also gonna have another sign over at the Donkey Park that talks more about the lumber industry and uh, the early settlers that worked on the industry. And then just to the left of this, the big blue sign, there's gonna be a sign, there is a sign there and it's, that basically says how we don't mow the grass or use pesticides. We're going to put a lot of the same information, but that sign also will be a directional sign that says what you're walking into, that talks about the pylons that are gonna have the history of the Native Americans, where the voice box is and where the honorary sculpture will be. And there is no front or into this park. So we're gonna have a sign there saying what you're walking into. And we're gonna have another one over by Donkey Park to uh, let people know before they go under the, the daylighted creek, the same information. And then the sign over at Donkey that talked about the Lushootsi people, the Lushootsi language. We have, now we know to not talk about the Native Americans in past tense, but in present tense. And so there's just a few words on that that are more correct now. And then the next slide, Josh, as many of you may have seen, there's a little voice box down there too. And so this is a this is a solar panel. It has four solar panels, and it has four buttons. And the first button basically is about forty five seconds. Uh, it basically says that uh, the council, the mayor, ad hoc committees, the tribe, all the entities that got together to to uh, recognize the the and the indigenous people. And basically why, why it's, why now, you know, just that we all got together to make this happen. The other three buttons have um, the Piao tribe uh, speaking uh, about the Tualaca village and about the Squababish people. So it actually says Tualaca three times at the end and Squababish three times. 
so that you can hear the Native Americans say the word so that we can learn how to pronounce it that way. And then the fourth button just talks about the the shoot seed uh, language. And they're all about 45 seconds each. So this is actually concreted in. And there was actually a little marker on where the, this was where a post was. And just saying that it was just like a historical marker. And that marker is still there. It's just behind the blue sign that you saw prior to this screen. So we just want to give you an update where we are. Uh, thank you, Council for helping to make this possible. And then the last thing I'd like to mention is um, our food bank, Fish, uh, poured their foundation on 9-9 of 21. So last week they poured their foundation for their new food bank, which has uh, support of, I think, all the, all the council. So it's, uh, we're very excited to, to be working with the food bank in that. Our, now it's time for the city. Well, that, that's great. That shows how large it is. This is right behind uh, Hagi Hihi or um, right next to where the, uh, uh, the present food bank is. And with that, it's time for the city administrator's report. Tony Pasecki. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate it. I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, I just want to take a couple of minutes to give council an update on the long-term care insurance that the uh, city staff has been working on uh, to keep us in compliance with the state law that was adopted a couple of years ago that uh, created a long-term care program to be administered by the state, uh, paid for through a payroll tax of every employee who is working in the, for an employer in the state of Washington. Um, that program, quite frankly, is not a very good one. Uh, I won't get into the great details of it, um, but it has a, a limited amount of money that can be um, put toward long-term care expenses. It requires uh, employees to pay into the plan for at least three years before they can actually even pull any uh, benefits from it. And they must be spending that money here in the state of Washington. So if somebody pays into the plan for 20 years and then moves out of state, say to Arizona to retire, they wouldn't have access to any of that funding. The only way to stay out of that program was to have a long-term care insurance policy, either individually or through your employer. Uh, we uh, were hoping to get into the AWC plan. Uh, unfortunately, we did not make the deadline to uh, get all of our information into AWC. Therefore, we had to try to find a plan of our own. We contacted a couple of insurance brokers who, uh, quite frankly, looked around pretty hard for us, and they, we were able to come up with three different alternatives, one of which uh, is very close to the AWC plan, uh, and we will be off. We, well, actually, we have talked with our employer, uh, employee groups about that, and uh, they seem very pleased with the, uh, the way the program works. Uh, the maximum amount of um, annual, I'm sorry, for lifetime benefits is greater than what AWC was going to provide and greater than the state. Uh, employees can choose to have more uh, coverage if they so choose. And if they end up uh, not using any of that coverage, it is a whole life insurance policy as well. Uh, they would be able to uh, get a cash value out of it if they so choose, or if unfortunately they pass away before they need long-term care, their beneficiaries would receive a uh, life insurance uh, payout. So we are going to be putting that into place. Uh, we will have the coverage ready to go before the no November 1st deadline. And uh, I'm available to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Tony. A staff report. Uh, we have our bond rating update. Uh, Your Honor. Question. Oh, I'm sorry. We have, we have a couple ahead, questions. Council Member Wu. Yes, thank you. Um, um, Mr. Paisecki, I had asked you to look into um, the dollar amount for 50000 And we have contacted AWC, and they told us that those figures are not available. Not available? We don't know how much it would cost the city? Uh, at the $50,000 level at, through AWC, they would not share that with us. 
So how can we provide this service for our our employees, knowing that the city has to pick up a certain amount of money between the the policy and um, and and we don't know and we won't get those numbers. What that number we, would be? We we know what the forty thousand dollar level is. Um, Camille did make a few phone calls and send an email. I will try talking to a few other folks at AWC that I know that might be able to share those figures. But as of today, they said they wouldn't be able to. And so, but well, we're not going through AWC, right? No, we are not, but we are comparing ourselves to AWC uh, to make sure that we're offering a, a plan that is similar to what they are. So does AWC not offer a $50,000 plan? I believe they do. I believe the uh, coverage that they are offering starts at a minimum of $40,000 and it goes up to $150,000. And our insurance company that we're looking at, or is there a is there a fifty thousand there? It starts at forty thousand. It goes up to two hundred and fifty thousand, and the employees can pick a level of coverage along that continuum. And we're suggesting to our employees what? Yeah. Are we not suggesting to our employees anything? Uh, we are suggesting that this program that I've just described is uh, the one that we will uh, provide for them. Uh, and it would be through a payroll deduction. Uh, the cost of the plan is a little bit more than the AWC plan. And we have talked about, they have asked for the city to uh, pick up the difference in the premiums. And we are working through that with them right now. But we won't know what that amount is. For the $40,000 level, we do know what that amount is. And it could be just a straight line difference. Um, we, we could uh, do a mathematical calculation to come up with what 50,000 might look like under the AWC plan. But like I said, I'm gonna to try to get that information from AWC the best I can over the next day or two. Thank you very much. Yes. Council Member Franich. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, the, the state plan, isn't that a, a 30 or $35,000 maximum? Yes, the maximum lifetime uh, benefit is $36,500 payable as uh, uh, up to $100 a day for 365 days. And they don't have to be continuous days. It could be someone who needed care for a month or two here and there. Um, but yeah, that is the maximum that the state is a, it has in their plan. So uh, I'm assuming that we will get further information on the, these different pricing um, levels and you know, we you briefly uh, when I ran into you uh, described that the we were going to try and have AWC available next year. So, I, I mean, this is still a fluid. There's nothing set in concrete yet. So, before you ask for some sort of council action, we'll have some numbers to talk about. That's uh, I have some numbers that I can share now, and I'm trying to get some additional numbers for you. That's fine. I don't need them now, but just you know. We'll have a, a menu of numbers before um, we move forward as a council with anything else, right? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yes, Council Member Odenberg. Yes, uh, Mr. Paisecki, when, when we talked a little bit about this, uh, you and, and just now you said that AWC's maximum uh, amount is $150,000. However, the one that we're looking at that we may do on our own is $250,000. And then we're talking about at some point in the future, possibly going uh, to the AWC. What if an employee chooses $200,000 and then it doesn't become available to him or her under the AWC and they've been paying payments on it already? I, I know that's a confusing question. I, I maybe no. I just brought that up, not so much for me to have an answer, but just something we certainly need to think about. Well, I can certainly talk to both our insurance broker and AWC about that. But given that this plan that we're going into is completely portable, an employee could leave employ could leave um, employment with the city, say after six months or a year of paying into the plan. And all they have to do is continue paying their premium and they have the coverage that they started with the city. So I would assume that if we were to move over to a different plan and an employee wanted to stay with a higher dollar value 
if that isn't offered with the new plan, they would be able to do that. But I'll have to confirm that with our broker. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Tony. And our staff report, we have a bond rating update uh, from our finance director, David Rodenbach. Uh, thank you, Mayor and members of council. Good evening. Uh, this week, uh, not tomorrow, but the day after the 15th, we close on the bonds that we're is issuing to refund this 2010 Civic Center debt. And then when we close on the 15th, the other bonds, the outstanding bonds that we're refunding are called as of the 16th, meaning uh, the city is no longer going to be responsible for them and the interest will cease and they'll be bought out. So to consummate this transaction, the, the city is wiring 1,594,000 from the Civic Center Debt Reserve Fund to the trustee. And then we're also issuing bonds in the amount of 1,116,000. And that's at the 0.65% interest rate. And those are non-callable for five years. They'll be due in 2026. Cost of issuance are about 30, is about $30,000. And, and generally, this is a bank placement. Uh, generally, costs would be in excess of 50000 So we saved quite a bit of money going straight to the banks. And the big news on this is for this budget that we're working on for 2022, we have an additional 366000 about in the general fund to spend on something else other than debt service. So with that, I'll take any questions. And thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Dave. I, I see a lot of smiles, so that's great. <laughs> that's that's great. And thank you, uh, past council members, uh, way before, uh, uh, for actually helping to make this possible too. Uh, OPG settlement agreement. Wow. Community Development Director Katrina Knudsen. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, following on the good news of Finance Director Dave Rodenbach, I will present another item of good news. Um, tonight, I'd like to provide a very brief update regarding the OPG lawsuit filed in response to the city adoption of Ordinance 1401, which resulted in amendments to the Village at Harbor Hill Development Agreement. Uh, please recall the City Council approved these amendments to the Development Agreement on June 14, 2021. The Growth Management Hearings Board appeal period runs for 60 days from uh, land use decisions, and that deadline expired on August 30th of this year. Because no appeals were filed, Olympic Property Group's attorney presented the stipulation and agreed order dismissing the case as required by the Second Amendment to the Settlement Agreement on August 31st, which was the next day after the expiration of the appeal period. The motion was filed with Pierce County Superior Court and placed on the court's motion docket for last Friday, September 10th. I am very happy to report that the court signed the order of dismissal late on the 10th and the lawsuit has been formally dropped and dismissed. So see lots of clapping, which is excellent news for, um, for the city. And for any listeners, uh, we've been receiving a lot of uh, request for information from members of the public in Gig Harbor North requesting this. We will be updating the website, the city's Village at Harbor Hill website, consistent with this information. Um, and essentially what this means formally is that the uh, development for Village at Harbor Hill is, um, can move forward, uh, again, subject to the developer's timelines. And we will keep you posted um, when and if that occurs. Great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Council. And uh, Daniel, uh, would you tell Jim Haney thank you for us? Um, you know, Jim Haney was our attorney on this, and he's not here. It took a it took a, a village. It took everyone to help make this happen. So please uh, tell Jim thank you. I'll do that. Thank you for the comment. You bet. And then our third staff report: Harborview Drive Conservation Property, uh, Public Works Director Jeff Langhill. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Uh, more good news. So we'll have three staff reports with good news all around. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to provide an update uh, with the Council of where we are with the Harborview Drive Conservation Futures property acquisition. 
Uh, it has had me reach some major milestones recently, and uh, we have a few more ahead of us, but we're, we're on the downhill slope on this one. Uh, Council Member Denson and staff continue to shepherd the property purchase through its processes. Remember, this is an 11 and a half acre property just north of the treatment plant and west of Harborview Drive and east of uh, Cushman Trail, so right in that area. Um, as you probably recall, Council took formal action back in February under Resolution 1200 to work collaboratively with the Puyallup Drive to apply for Pierce County Conservation Futures Program grant to acquire this land. Uh, the net result uh, is looking like it's going to be relatively low cost to the city and the Puyallup Tribe the city has authorized $20,000 uh, and Puyallup Tribe has provided $50,000 for this project that uh, came in. Uh, the Since we had Resolution 1200 approved back in February, uh, the city has received a title report. We've completed the property appraisal which the property came in well above the uh, purchase price. And then we entered into a purchase and sale agreement and completed the phase one environmental site assessment and then completed the record of survey. So all of that has been completed from the city's end. And then Pierce County had a whole host of uh, milestones that they met through this process already. Uh, they call it, by the way, if you look for it in Pierce County records, they call it the North Creek Salmon Heritage Site. So it's a little different title. Um, they've moved the grant application through their uh, technical advisory committee. It ranked number one with the Citizens Advisory Board rankings, and it was approved by the county's Community Development Committee with the number one ranking and uh, was approved by county council to proceed forward to the budget process uh, back in August. Next steps for the county include budget adoption, which is supposed to occur later this fall, maybe November. And then there, after that, uh, starting in January and hopefully being completed before the November process um, is a closing. So we have Quite a bit of paperwork to do with the county, and uh, we'll work through our final processes. And hopefully, the goal is to be closed by October of next year. Um, right now, the uh, we're working to get an earnest money payment of twenty thousand dollars made before the end of September, uh, and then we will review the closing documents uh, that are outlined in our process, in the county's process, and the mayor has the authority to sign all of that. So we just continue to move forward and I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Did you say it would be complete next year, the transaction? Yes, it, it uh, we can't go through closing until after January and then we'll just work on closing documents after that, but it has to be completed before November of 2022. Thank you, Council Member Wu. Yes, thank you. I, I want to thank uh, Council Member Denson, the Puyallup Tribe. I want to thank our mayor, the city council, everybody, the staff who's involved in this. Our community is going to be really happy to see these trees here and not a bunch of houses. So this was a wonderful piece of property. And um, thanks to everybody concerned. Thank you. Yes. Council Member Rodenberg. Yeah, my question is actually uh, for community Development Director Knudsen. Uh, I wasn't quick enough with my button after she gave her report. So if there's no other questions on the uh, conservation project, I'd like to ask a question uh, having to do with the OPG lawsuit. Uh, maybe she isn't the one that can answer it, but possibly maybe when all the billing is done and completed, I'd like to know how much, and I think the council would like to know, how much did that lawsuit cost us? Uh, to de defend the lawsuit. I know there's no way of adding up all the countless hours that the staff put in, but just attorney fees and stuff like that, I, I think that's a number that we should be interested in um, when we look going forward to looking at lawsuits and trying to avoid them. Councilmember Rodenberg, we can pull the total, total legal costs from Ogden Murphy Wallace invoices and get that to you soon. Can you also show us how much it, 
we will have taken in by keeping the fee at, um, I believe, 5,071 per dwelling unit versus the 2,000 it was, because that has to be weighed into the matrix as well. Is that somewhat possible? That's probably a Jeff answer question. Yeah, to say we can provide that information. Um, we, we provided a routine annual update to council on revenues we've received from the TIF, but we could break out a scenario of what if, if the council would like that. Yeah, I, I think that'd be great because I think uh, my, my belief it was well worth it for um, going down forward. So that way we'll do both what Councilman Rodenberg said and also showing uh, what you just said. I'll provide a summary from the date of um, effect, effective date until the date the lawsuit was ended and provide a summary at that point. Right. Good. We also got some things from the, from the settlement too that need to be put in there as well. Great, and again, thank you council and thank you council member Jensen too for your hard work on the conservation land too. Thank you. Now is the time for public comment on non-agenda items. So anyone that from the public um, that wishes to comment on something not on the agenda, uh, please do so. We'll start with anything that might've been uh, sent to our uh, clerk. Uh, Tony, do we have any written comments? Yes, Your Honor, I do have one. Let me go ahead and read that. It is from Hobart Denny. I am Hobart Denny. My address is 8940 Southeast Colvos Drive, Olala, Washington. My main, cons my main commerce area is Gig Harbor, Washington. I have a dream of a village of cottage homes for seniors in Gig Harbor. The prospects for this housing are seniors on fixed incomes who need to simplify their lives by minimizing their living accommodations. The city of Gig Harbor can assist in achieving these goals of attainable housing, a thousand square feet or less, lifetime lease at a fixed rate, designed for limited ability to access, convenient location for life needs and more. We need to develop a plan to access federal, state and private funds designated to assist persons in need of attainable housing. We can offer volunteers to assist appropriate staff with searching for the availability of funds, grant writing, routine office tasks, building site observation, coordinate with local churches for potential sites and more. We request that the city council establish a study group of appropriate city staff and volunteers to prepare a report slash request to implement a program whereby the city of Gig Harbor will implement a program to develop and encourage the resources to make attainable housing opportunities for seniors in need. Thank you for considering this worthwhile project. And that is all your honor. Okay, thank you. I see there's a couple hands raised. <clears throat> Uh, you have three minutes. Please state your name and address. And I will start with uh, Tracy Ivern, Irving. Sorry, Tracy. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, if you can try a little, try that one more time. Can you hear me? Yes. I was just hoping to understand the property you were talking about that just recently. You said uh, Gig Harbor purchased property and I wasn't clear what that was. Okay, um, uh, public comment, this is important. Public comment isn't to, uh, a Q and A, but it is, you know, it is maybe if you came in late, it is behind the wastewater treatment plant it is 11, I believe uh, Robin can correct me, but 11 acres, roughly 11 acres that the Piaf tribe has helped put a down payment, a hefty down payment along with the city and it's gonna become conservation land. And we've uh, applied for a grant that more than likely we are gonna be approved for, which will cover majority of all the costs outside of our environmental, uh, uh, impact, environmental uh, work that we needed to make sure that it was clean of uh, contaminants. Thank you. And uh, the next caller, 874. Are you there? Good evening, Mayor Kuhn. Ladies and gentlemen of the council, can you hear me okay? We can. 
Yeah, this is uh, Thomas Wick, Gig Harbor, Hunt Street Northwest. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch base on, Mayor Kuhn, is I'm looking at your um, your blogs that you do routinely, and I noticed something that you write at the end of them pretty pretty consistently. Is you write what well, one thing I'd like to point there. out? This is a, it's a council meeting, so you should direct your comments to council. All right, I'm directing it to the council. Thank you for correcting me, Mayor Kuhn. So, council, um, I'm looking at Mayor Kuhn's blogs, um, and consistently he writes, be courteous and remember to be kind to each other. And that's pretty consistent on his blogs. And what I'm asking council to consider is, um, I asked Mr. Franich, Councilman Franich, to convey to the council that my father-in-law and I would like to, we actually, we did, we said, let's talk, sit down and have a discussion about putting the ditch in that was reported and that was documented that did not exist across his property. And we um, never heard a response back from anybody. And I'm tying this into an earlier comment from Councilman Rodenberg, where he expressed a concern about um, avoiding cost of litigation. So your build out continues in the Scanty Avenue drainage basin and under the auspices that a ditch existed that doesn't, my father-in-law and I downstream property owners say, hey, we don't wanna litigate this. So let's talk about putting in this ditch that you said was there that didn't exist and no response. So I'm, like I said, I'm tying it back into Mr. Rodenberg's um, earlier comment about avoiding litigation because you kind of pushed us up against the wall um, because development continues and the ditch isn't there. So I would just ask that council give that some serious discussion and maybe even do a little deliberation on that um, this evening, if you would. Um, Cause I think it's a little inconsistent with Mayor Kuhn's um, pretty consistent response in his blogs where he says, remember to be kind to each other. So I ask the council to please give that some consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wick. Are there any other callers that wish to raise their hand? <clears throat> okay, I will close the public comment on non-agenda items. Our first item tonight is um, our only item on new business is the first read of ordinance 1465, updating GHMC 2.52 public records. And the report tonight will be from our interim city clerk, Josh Stecker. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Uh, this is the first reading of Ordinance 1465. It is intended to modify and update our public records policy. It's codified in Gig Harbor Municipal Code Chapter 2.52. Um, the chief aim of this update is to address the number of records requests that the city receives and the order in which we process those. Um, the way the Public Records Act is written, um, it comes with kind of a dual mandate, which says that we are supposed to provide the fullest assistance we can to the inquirers who request records, um, but at the same time, we're not supposed to allow that to interfere, interfere with our other essential functions that we have. Um, typically, this is not an issue for us. The clerk's office and the city staff that support the clerk's office and records requests, um, we usually do a pretty good job of balancing our workload and making sure that everything gets done in the most timely manner and we don't miss any deadlines. Um, but what is happening is occasionally the city receives requests that are fairly extensive. Um, they require a significant amount of time of research. Uh, they deal with a large number of records. Um, they require extensive attorney review. Um, and these requests that we get that are, that are in that, of that nature can take up quite a bit of time. Um, and currently we don't allow those requests to interfere with our other duties, but it's become apparent that we need to have some kind of a formal policy that says how we are gonna address those. So what this ordinance does is it takes into account the amount of time that the city, says, city spends doing records requests and just says that we're gonna put a cap on that. It says this uh, ordinance update will put a cap of eight hours per week um, spent on city records and that's across all city staff. Um, or just for reference, going back, I went back and pulled the numbers on how much time we spent on records requests last year in 2020. 
and it averaged out to about six and a half hours a week. So eight hours is ample time for us to cover the most basic records requests, the ones that are really easy. Um, and I kind of estimate that that's probably about 80 or even more, 80% or more of the records requests that we receive are really simple um, locating one document and responding to the requester. And those were able to um, fulfill pretty quickly. Um, and what this does is it, this cap will um, basically allow us to complete all of those. But when we get those larger requests like that, it gives us a policy that says, we're gonna need to take a little more time to get back to you on those. Um, and that's, that's pretty much the intent of this. Now, the, the cap of eight hours is not a hard cap. We still have the statutory requirement to respond to every requ request that comes in. Every request must be addressed within at least five business days. So when we hit our eight hours, we don't suddenly stop processing records requests. We still need to respond to the ones that come in. And like I said, for a majority of those, they can be pretty simple requests. So it's in our best interest to just locate the record and respond in that way, rather than tell them the requester, we're just gonna wait until next week to do your, your job. So it doesn't prevent us from responding in a timely manner to most people. Um, this update that we're doing gives the public records officer who's officially the city clerk, but it can also be designated to other staff. It gives the public records officer the ability to determine the best order to respond to records requests so that we have, um, we're making sure that we're being the most, responding in the most efficient way and we're not leaving anyone behind. Um, the other changes that you'll see in this ordinance, um, sometimes we get multiple requests from the same requester. This just clarifies our policy that if you're going to submit more than one request, we're not gonna start working on your new request until we've finished with your first one. And I think that sums up most of the changes you'll see in here. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any that come up. Yeah, we've got uh, Council Member Aversol. Yeah, Josh, does the council get notified when we get a public records request? Because I know we've seen emails um, regarding one subject, but does every request get notified to the council? And my, I guess my question is, uh, I'm trying to, you know, get the volume the, of the request. And so do we have access to all that information? You do not, no. Council typically does not get notified when there's a records request that comes in. Occasionally, um, you'll get copied on them. So you'll see some that, that come through where the requester wants the council to know what they're looking for. Um, but I believe last year we had in excess of 300 um, not including the police department requests, we had in excess of 300 requests, and um, I would guess that you weren't copying on most of those. No, okay. Thank you. Councilmember Franich, did you did that answer your question? Or did you have a clarifying question? Uh, yes, yes, I, I did. did. Go ahead. Uh, so, is do you? I'm assuming you are the officer, Josh. The city clerk is the public records officer, but the code is written that that can be designated to anyone else. Um, in the event that there's a, like a complicated records request down in community development, I'll often rely on other staff down there to do most of the research on that. Yeah, I saw it, it, I, I saw that or designee is, is kind of um, been deleted from a few different sections. Yeah, that's just kind of to clarify a little bit. Um, I think very early in that chapter, we identified the public records officer as being the city clerk or designee. So it wasn't necessary to have or designee repeated over and over in the chapter. It's just wherever you see the term public records officer, it can either mean the city clerk or someone assigned by the city clerk. Okay, and um, does the police department process their own public records request or do you do those as well? They all come through me and they are, kind of a part of this chapter and kind of also not a part of this chapter. Um, they are technically requests for public records, so they're subject to all this, but requests for um, police records, they have a little more stringent requirement for how they need to respond and how soon they need to respond. So statutorily, nothing in here would restrict how we respond to police records. Oh, okay. So because I'm assuming that, you know, for a court case or what have you, some of those might be a little more uh, time sensitive. So Yeah, I think the state law, I'm not familiar with the chapter on police records uh, that much, but I think the word is that they need to respond promptly to any request for um, police records. 
And that's a little bit different than our five day response. I, I don't remember the exact wording there, but it's it's stringent enough that, that this would not apply to them. Okay, so th this resolution doesn't really, as you said, doesn't really change anything to do with what's going on with the police. I don't think so. Well, I'm just wondering about that eight hour limit, whether, you know, that is going to take into consideration the uh, police department staff. Yeah, I think they will count towards that cap time a little bit, but you know, like I said, once we hit our eight hours, they still have that statutory requirement to respond. So um, it's not going to affect them. Okay. Um, and on page 11 of 14, the uh, under paragraph O, the last uh, few words there, to the extent reasonably and feasibly possible, uh, is that determined by the officer? I believe so. Let me just double check that real quick. Yeah, that's at the discretion of the public records officer. And if, if there is a member of the public that um, was feels that they, they weren't being um, uh, served in a timely manner, I, then who, who would would you be the arbitrator of that or would it be the city administrator or the mayor or? Uh, most likely the city administrator they could appeal to. Um, there isn't a provision for that in this chapter of the code, but um, as the public records officer's supervisor, they could definitely seek that out. Um, otherwise the superior court is, is responsible for appeals to public records decisions. And then on page 12, 14, um, under 2.52.100 costs of providing copies. Um, can you uh, refresh my memory on the, it refers to the fee schedule that is in the code book, I'm assuming. The, the fee schedule is a resolution that council adopts and it's usually updated about once a year. I think we did one about four months ago. Yeah, do you have to recall what that fee schedule, what, what it costs for per page for a public record request? Yeah, so the cost is for photocopies, I believe it's 10 cents per page. And then for electronic files, for every four electronic files we provide, I think there's a cost of five cents. Okay, very there's, good. There's a few other uh, miscellaneous fees in there as well, but those are the, the main ones we use. Okay, and my last question is on uh, page 13 and 14 at the very bottom, 2.52.110, review of denials of public records. Uh, what determines if something will be denied? Uh, that would be if the request, um, well, if the request is only for uh, records that are exempted from disclosure uh, by state law or um, there's also provision that we can re reject a request if the request is overly broad. Like if someone asks for every single email ever sent to the city or from the city, um, we could reject a request on that basis. And, and who is the decision maker on whether or not they're gonna be denied? Is that you? Or yeah, that would be the public officer? records officer. Um, definitely in consultation with the city attorney. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Great. Any other clarifying questions for Josh? Okay. With that, I will open it up for public comment. <clears throat> Again, this is uh, three minutes or less. And um, please state your name and address. And I will go with caller 874. Yes, Mayor Kuhn. Um, Council, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, um, and I want someone to, I know you don't ordinarily chime in and do a Q&A, but I'm asking you to in this case, and you just did it with a former um, citizen. But I believe I just heard Mr. Stecker say that the charge is five cents per four scanned copies of public records. I'm looking at an email from Mr. Piasecki where I'm being charged 10 cents per single copy and I was told it was 2,000 copies. But anyway, backing up, 
Um, that's something I would like the council to address or Mr. Stecker after I've completed this um, brief statement here. So I did a public records request on September 25th, 2020, and I looked at the scope of the request, and I, I'm, I'm aware of and cognizant of the exemptions um, as far as attorney-client privilege, et cetera, that you, you could say, well, we, we got to go through these emails. We have to do, you know, due diligence. And the maximum time it would take somebody with just moderate competence would be one hour to complete that request for public records. And that was submitted September 25th, 2020. And today I received an email from Mr. Piasecki saying, oh, we discovered these binders with 2000 files. So you're gonna have to do A, B, C, or D, or we're not gonna be able to proceed. And that's a problem. So anyway, the other issue is you guys are trying to clarify whether um, public records requests are processed in the order they were received or not. That's a given, given state law, because fines and penalties accrue daily. And there would be no way to assess the fines and penalties if you were to start processing uh, recent public, re public records requests when you left something that was a year, year old unresolved. So that's a concern. So I would ask that Mr. Secker uh, um, explain why I'm being quoted 10 cents per page per record and I believe I just heard him say it was five cents per four scanned copies. That's a concern. Um, and also I have questions about who the public records request the officer is, because I've had a lot of back and forth with Mr. Piasecki, but he's not the public records officer. Mr. Secker is, but Mr. Secker has not communicated with me yet. He's the one that's supposed to be making the decisions based on what I just heard. So I would ask that you guys back up after I'm done here and please clarify this because Mr. Piasecki is not the public records officer. Mr. Secker is, but Mr. Secker is not communicating with me regarding a public records request that is approaching one year um, that has not been filled. And as you all know, I did pay the city $200 in advance for this um, for these public records and I've yet to receive them. In fact, I was supposed to receive them today and today I received this email saying, hey, um, we just found out there's these 2000 pages of records that we, you have to make a decision before we're gonna turn them over to you. So I, I would respectfully request that you guys address the cost and who exactly is responsible as the public records officer for public records. And if you would do that this evening, I'd be very much appreciative. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will, you know, I did answer the other person's question. So you have, you have a, a right to uh, get an answer to, I will, I will say that we, we are trying to make it so that we have less public records requests from multiple staff. So, and we're also wanting one person to deal with it, with attention. So I've, you know, for many years, as you know, I've had our city administrator be the person to respond to your concerns. So that one person knows uh, all the information and it doesn't have to be spread through lots of different departments and have lots of different people having public requests off the dialogues. Uh, Josh, do you uh, have an answer on the five cents, 10 cents? The city's fee for making photocopies of paper records is, or scanning paper records into a digital file is 10 cents per page. The fee for just providing digital files, files that already exist digitally, is for every four files that we provide, we charge five cents. So because we have paper copies that we need to either scan or photocopy, the charge is 10 cents per page. Thank you. And if, uh, if Mr. Wick, if you have further questions, yeah, feel free to reach out to Tony Pasecki, our city administrator for clarifying answers. Uh, Daniel, you're probably gonna tell me something I already said, but do you have any comment uh, i was just going to encourage the discussion to stick to the ordinance but um i think that we've just about wrapped up so thanks thank you are there any other callers that wish to comment on this new business item one okay i will close the public comment period
and uh, refer back to council for deliberation and action. That's all right. If there's no, yeah, yeah, council member for Anich. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think that um, citizens' availability, the general public's availability to uh, have public records requests is a very important thing for them to have to be able to take advantage of. Um, I don't see any um, anything in this uh, resolution that is going to uh, in any way jeopardize that. I'm, you know. Concerned with limiting the having this eight hour, um, it's not a hard and fast number set. So that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable that um, I think that um, I don't think the city's going to put up any roadblocks to try and block anybody's um, public records request. So um, I have a little bit of concern about having that eight hour cap on there, but. Um, Sounds like there is the ability to um, exceed that if need be. Um, so I'm comfortable with it. Thank you. Thank you. But I uh, have a council member to make a motion. This will return for a second reading oh. at the next meeting. I'm sorry, you're correct. Thank you. Uh, council member Himes. Yeah, I, I did have a question. Is there any um, dialogue that goes with these submissions? For example, if you if you submit what I call a fishing expedition type search versus a very straightforward search, is there any feedback uh, before the fact to the submitter of, for example, the fishing expedition that, hey, one, this may take some time, and two, is there some priority in the order in which you've submitted these? In other words, is there is there something here that's really critical to you that we should be going after? Uh, it seems like we've got all these issues after the fact, and some of these, I, I have a feeling that uh, maybe if we um, um, uh, communicated with the public and, and vice versa on these things, some of these issues may be avoided. Yeah, uh, Council Member Himes, that is our standard procedure. When we get a request that seems overly broad or complicated and it's difficult for us to tell what records the requester is looking for, um, that's our first step is to reach out to them and ask them to clarify what their request is and see if we can narrow down what they're looking for so that we're not searching for a lot of records that are unresponsive. Um, and in some cases, they are just fishing expeditions and and when it comes to that, and there's a lot of records that we need to search, um, we're going to search them in the order that makes the most sense for our staff time. Um, so whichever is going to be uh, allow us to get the most records quickest, that's what we're going to focus on first. Okay. And by the way, just just from a marketing standpoint, are, are are most of the requests for records from citizens? Are they coming from businesses? Are they coming from other um, entities? Any, any, any feeling for what that is? It, it's a good mix of both. Um, we get requests from construction companies that want records on capital projects that we are have done or are about to under, go underway with. Um, we get this request from citizens quite often just about their own piece of property and what records we have about it. Um, it it's a pretty good mix. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll have this come back for a second reading. Uh, now it's time for council reports and comments. The first is our park commission meeting of September 1st, council member Aversol. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Parks commission meeting September 1st, the minutes were approved. Uh, we introduced or were introduced to a new member, Will Appleton. Um, and I think he may have potentially gave Deep Harbor a new catchphrase, what's the gig? Never heard that before, but apparently that's uh, something that's big up in Alaska. So start thinking about a new bumper sticker there. Um, ben gave an update on the pros plan survey results. Um, we got a status update on Austin's parks um, project and uh, Jeff Langham told us about the Austin Honoring Art Project, um, the re-signing of the park, 
and the uh, Twalcut Estuary, the uh, Pylon Panel Project. Uh, he gave us an update on the community paddler stock, uh, also on the sports complex phase one and phase B, or 1A and 1B. Uh, he said that, that hopefully we would be breaking ground or maybe completing that project. I can't remember exactly what it was, but right around 2023 was the goal. And uh, that he was also, we were also working still on the Scansy Net Shed painting project. Uh, that, that was something that was going to be happening. He also gave us uh, a little information regarding um, mid-September parts. Oh, uh, in mid-September, the parks manager interviews should begin and that they had 15 applicants uh, for that position. So that's good. And then also, finally, lastly, um, Ed votes. Uh, the, he gave us an update on the park update on that and the roundabout. Uh, committee meeting updates, Cushman Trail signage, and, uh, and we're waiting on a budget request to the council. So that is concludes my Parks Commission report for September 1st. Thank you, Council Member. And our second is our Planning and Building Committee meeting of September 7th, Council Member Himes. Uh, yes, so uh, we met on uh, the 7th and we covered three major items. Uh, the first one was uh, uh, short term rentals. Um, there has been a uh, reports of short term rentals uh, starting to grow in the uh, in the Gig Harbor area. And uh, well, it's not a, a, a problem right now. However, it could become one if it were to expand to extremes okay in the future um we definitely ruled out any kind of a ban that's not in the cards from our perspective but there was feeling that uh, from uh, staff and from council members that we should at least have the capability to to uh monitor and regulate this uh, this type of activity Staff's going to prepare a, a proposal around this, and we'll be coming forward with this. Uh, again, it's not a problem right now, but it could become one in the future. Um, second item is House Bill 1220, Emergency Shelters and Housing, Local Planning and Development. Um, this was just passed recently in the state legislature. Um, there may be some items in the existing code that are uh, could be interpreted as being at odds with this particular uh, piece of legislation. And uh, staff is basically pursuing uh, a follow up on this of potential changes may be required the code to make sure that we're compatible with the uh, with the directive essentially from House Bill 1220. So that's more of a compatibility issue more than anything. Uh, third item is the growth discussion, and that's the Vision 2050, uh, which covers the 2020 to 2044 um, uh, growth uh, targets discussion. Uh, Pierce County Planning Office right now is uh, working on this and for the 2020 to 2044 targets for cities and urban portions of unincorporated Pierce County. Um, this is an item that we'll be taking up in the future, hopefully in a study session shortly. Uh, the, the kicker here is Gig Harbor uh, overachieved in the 2010 to 2020 period uh, with the targets that were given to us uh, to the tune of essentially we achieved 94% of our overall 2010 to 2030 dwelling targets uh, in 2020. We, 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 were almost, we were almost done in 2020 with the number of units to be built um, in that time span. That represents basically an overbuild relative to target of about 800 dwelling units, okay? Which if you go by the 2.3 um, occupants per dwelling unit, that's 1,840 population gain, okay? That was in excess of the target requirements. Um, 
So that's what we are trying to deal with because the way it's set up right now, we have no indication that we will ever get credit for having overachieved uh, that target. For your reference, Tacoma in 2020 was only 17% of the way to their targets. Puyallup, likewise, was about 26% of the way to their targets. Um, as an overall Pierce County, take all the cities, all the unincorporated urban areas, uh, we were only 27% of the way to target in 2020 for that span from 2010 to 2030, whereas Gig Harbor was 94% of the way there by their numbers. And by the way, we think with the revised um, um, density of occupants per dwelling unit, we, we probably made it. We probably have achieved it already. Okay, it's there, it's in the bag. So that's what's at stake here. Um, like I said, we'll be um, scheduling, I'd like to have this in a study session where we can bring the whole council up to speed on what's going on here. And uh, basically uh, look at the potential impact on the 2050 target generation and the possible actions that we may take going forward. So that's the report for the Planning and Building Committee. Thank you. And um, then we've got our Intergovernmental Affairs Committee meeting uh, Monday, September 27th at 4 p.m. I'm sorry, that was, uh, I'm sorry, that was our announcement of other meetings. I will go on to public comment. I believe Council Member Wook. I, I, I will go on to Council Member comments. Uh, Council Member Wook, you had your hand raised a, a moment earlier. I did. I, I did. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, to our staff that's been working with the folks at Spinnaker Ridge. Spinnaker Ridge has been doing some tree, um, some has been working on some tree issues, and they've been working with their staff, and they've been extremely. Uh, they've had really good things to say about our staff, so I want to pass that along to them. I was also chatting with some folks in Gig Harbor North who had great praise for Brie Ellis. And uh, she's our stormwater expert. And she's been working with the folks in Gig Harbor North. So kudos to Brie as well. Um, Want to say a special thank you to uh, Mandy and Scott this week. It's, uh, it, they had a tough week last week. And uh, you know they are there to answer phone calls from our public and to be uh, kind. And, and, and they did a good job. So thank you to those folks. And one last thing, um, I think everybody in this community was surprised and concerned about the development at 38th and Hunt Street. That is in the county, but it's right across the street from city. So I would like to know, and uh, maybe um, city administrator Piasecki can help determine this, how can our citizens be aware when something is going to happen right across the street from the city of Gig Harbor so that our citizens can make a comment on that when during the comment time. Uh, I, I, you know, our con citizens are really concerned about what's happening uh, this close to the city. I, I, I didn't know about it until I drove by and they were taking the trees off. So, um, so what can we do about that? Well, we have talked with the county, both the uh, development review folks and our county council member uh, about our displeasure with not being as involved in that particular project as we should have been. Um, I, 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 I don't know if one of those great big uh, de development signs was up on the piece of property uh, or if the county even requires it. Um, but what we have said is we need to be informed when projects are going to be going on. We need to be involved in the SEPA decisions uh, that are being uh, worked through. And we can put information on our website if we do come across a large project like that, uh, that folks need to know about. And uh, Jeff, do you have anything you can add to that? Katrina was, uh, had to leave the meeting earlier or else she could have jumped in as well. No, I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. Jeff, I, would you know that if the county, I would, I would think and hope the county would require 
the signs like we do. Do they? Do you know if they do? I don't know if they require those same <laughs> signs. I know they require notification. And where they where they're mailing letters to, to properties within a certain uh, distance. Yes. Okay. Tony, this is Katrina. Um, no. I'm <laughs> on my cell phone. I wanted okay. to answer Councilmember Wook's question, and the property was posted. It did have a, a notice sign. There were uh, multiple citizens within the city and the county that did testify on that project in particular, um, as well as we were told that they mailed out notices within 500 feet. Um, so that is to say what was done, what we're looking to do in the future is when we receive the notices of public hearing, um, posting those for our citizens on our website to, um, to see. And so we're still working out, you know, the mechanics of that, but that should be forthcoming. Uh, minimum, we will notify our planning commission and put the notice on the website so that the citizens can be aware. Thank you. I think that would be go a long way towards that. Is there any way that uh, folks can sign up for notify me for those notices? Yes, that's something that we could look into on our website. Uh, I'll speak with Michelle Thomas and Josh Stecker and see if we can get that set up so that they'll automatically be notified when we receive those notices. That would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. We did also meet with the count with uh, some county council right after that and said that things that are in our UGA, we'd like to be aware of. Uh, we actually talked to them of how we wanted them to actually adhere to our city standards when eventually it's gonna be uh, annexed into the city. Uh, the county actually told us that they're not gonna do that. They're not gonna uh, conform to different cities UGAs. Part of it, I understand they'd have all these conflicting cities that want them to conform to them, but they said that they're much more aggressive than our city is in building. And that was discouraging to hear. So uh, at the direction of their executive director. Council member Dinson. Yes, um, I was gonna speak to something else, but on this topic, Mayor Kuhn, thanks for bringing up those efforts that I know Ms. Knudsen has been engaged in to work with the county to try and have some consistency between our building standards and zoning and theirs because that just makes sense in terms of signage and lot size and buffers which would have been really nice here so are you saying miss knutson that that is no longer moving forward council member denson the discussions with pierce county again this was at a elected level and as well as um, a city staff or county staff level those discussions are going to continue to occur um, we are going to continue our effort to try to enter into an urban growth area management agreement whereby the county would review against our standards. Uh, that may not be their exact preference, but we do believe that um, with our cooperative relationship, we can um, push forward and, um, and continue on those efforts. It may take a while or it may not happen, but we do agree with council that that is something uh, worth pursuing, uh, as well as our urban growth area um, annexation analysis that is ongoing. The county is supportive of that as well uh, with the Ugama uh, Urban Growth Area Management Agreement looking at uh, potential targeted annexations um, within that agreement as well. Okay, thank you. And I'm really glad that those discussions are continuing. I thought that was really smart and forward thinking of you, Ms. Knutson. So I'm, I'm glad that's still going. I wanted to talk about signs, which for some reason have just bugged the heck out of me this year. Um, so we're seeing a lot of not just political signs, but business signs and sports um, league signs and event signs just going up everywhere. And one thought I had is I can't imagine that our candidates for different local offices really want the city to be spending our time and resources running around picking up signs. And maybe some of these newer candidates just don't fully understand our sign ordinance. So my first thought was that maybe our code enforcement officer could place a quick call to some of these candidates and say, hey, you know, we've gotten reports of a couple of your signs that aren't in appropriate approved right of way locations um, to make sure maybe they would go pick them up themselves so our poor code enforcement officer can focus on other things. So that would be number one, but, but we definitely need some more enforcement. And I believe Mayor Kuhn is gonna put 
some more resources in the budget for that. But I'm just, especially along Borgen, if there's just signs everywhere, even in the roundabout for like cheap mortgages. And to me, it's, it's not looking good. And I've heard from other citizens as well. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to be asking council in our budget for a full-time code enforcement person instead of two days. And obviously we need it. Mayor Kuhn, may I um, add sure. to what you said? Thank you. Um, I do, again, appreciate the mayor's uh, support for full-time code enforcement in next year's budget. We uh, are having a few staff shortages this week, although we are going to be instituting weekly sign sweeps. Um, so that should be cleaned up. And Councilmember Denson, I did notice the proliferation of some of the, the signs over the weekend. So that's um, well noted. Also to inform council, we did send letters uh, and have contacted each candidate that's running for uh, office. And so you know, we'll continue to try to work proactively with them to pick those up. But if not, again, we'll institute our weekly uh, sign sweeps to ensure that that's taken care of. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Knudsen. Yes, uh, Councilman Raversel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I kind of also got skipped on the um, board's community candidate review committee report. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we met this afternoon, uh, September 13th. The minutes were approved. We interviewed two candidates for the lodging tax advisory committee, uh, both Sue Braden and uh, Mary Damaris. Uh, were our interviews, and I believe that uh, both of those folks were selected to return to the LTAC committee. Uh, we also talked about uh, LTAC appointment re recommendations uh, and had a discussion of the roster. Uh, there are a couple of issues that we have with some of the members on uh, the, the roster, and I won't go into the details of that, but something that needs to be reviewed. Uh, we uh, talked about making amendments to the Geek Harbor uh, Municipal Code 2.21 for the Design Review Board. Um, we want to or talk about limit, limiting areas. Members need to belong to either the city limits, the uh, urban growth area, or the Geek Harbor Peninsula. Uh, Council Member Wook said that we would like to get more landscape architects, I believe she said, on there, or at least have one. Um, and uh, again, we have an issue with members not following city codes who are on that uh, roster and that needs to be addressed, but we need to talk about how that's going to be addressed. Uh, Community Development Director Katrina Knudsen also uh, reviewed six of the categories for the Design Review Board uh, 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 for council members. And uh, we do agree that the design manual needs to be reviewed. And that concludes my uh, comments on the uh, Boards and Commission Review Committee. I also like to follow up with just two of the points um, that were talked about earlier as regards to Pierce County. Uh, I think the citizens of Geek Harbor need to support any candidate that is running for that council that is a citizen of Geek Harbor so that our interests are looked after. So um, I won't mention names, but any citizens of Geek Harbor that are running, we need to support those candidates so that they look out for our interests. And then lastly, you won't have to see uh, anyone picking up signs, my signs, uh, because there will be none. So thank you. That's all. Thank you, Councilman Raversold. Any other comments from Council? Okay. Thank you. Announcement of up upcoming meetings, a Public Works Committee meeting on Tuesday, September 14th at 3 p.m. We have the inter- Governmental Affairs Committee meeting Monday, September 17th at 4 p.m. 27th. I'm sorry, what? It's on the 27th. Oh, 27th. We also have the Finance and Safety Committee meeting Monday, September 20th at 4 p.m. And then, Jeff, don't we have a um, water uh, open house on the 14th and 15th of this month as well? Yes, right. we have... Uh, we have stormwater re utility revenue studies both Wednesday at 4 and Thursday at 5.30. Perfect. And those are virtual, correct? Yes, they are. They're via uh, Zoom. Great. Thank you. I do uh, With that, do I have a motion to adjourn our council meeting? Move to adjourn. 
Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Council. Meeting is adjourned. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night.